we are celebrating this year, this summer, uh, this May of 2019, the 25th anniversary of the OU College World Series uh, Championship. We're going to start this shit over because that was not good. Hello and welcome to a non-doc sports video cast. We are in uncharted territory, but we have a really important topic for you today. Uh, OU sports, specifically the 25th anniversary of the OU Baseball World College World Series victory. I believe it was June 11th. June 11th. And um, I have, I'm Trey Savage. I'm the editor of nondoc.com. You mostly know me from political ramblings uh, and capital coverage. Uh, but today, I'm not here to be fair or balanced or anything. I'm here to talk about my love of OU baseball as a child uh, and the 1994 team, which is celebrating its 25th uh, anniversary of their their second uh, uh, collegiate college world series. 1951 was the first one. 1994 was the second one. I was like nine and a half years old. This is Jeremy Cowan, and you were how old? Uh, in 51 or 94? Uh, yeah, either way. Okay, in 94, I, I just turned, uh, I hadn't qu- quite turned 20 yet by the time they won the national title. So oh. I was 19. Okay, and you were an OU fan? I was certainly an OU fan. I was certainly an OU baseball fan. I, uh, had started following OU baseball closely, uh, two years prior in 1992 when they had made their way to the College World Series for like the first time in several, in a couple of decades. I'm not mistaken. Right. And so I started following them uh, closely then. um, And then, of course, you know, followed them in 94. Later on, in 95, uh, I started working at the student newspaper at OU that I asked to be their beat writer. And um, they gave me the beat. And so I got to cover OU baseball even closer. So I even became more attached to it then. And now you are a member of the Yardbirds cheering group. That I sort of used to be part of. I don't make it down much. I don't make it out as much as I want to anymore. Um, a couple of, you know, when you have fake grass on the field, it kind of takes a little of the interest away from me. I have to admit, no one, you want to go out to the baseball park, you want to see green grass and fly balls. And now you can only see fly balls. They ruined my childhood. Yeah. Um, but back to uh, my childhood, um, I was a big fan. Went to, I think, all but four of the home games that year. In 94? Um, in 1994, I had somewhere the tickets. I went and dug in my parents' house in my old bedroom through cabinets and things to try to find the Ziploc baggie of all the ticket stuff that I had, and I, I couldn't find it. But I did pull out some stuff for us, this old awesome corduroy. Uh, try this on, Jeremy. Oh, You've got such uh, a good face. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is going to look good on me Corduroy right here. OU Sooners uh, uh, hat. Um, we've got a bunch of baseballs. <laughs> it makes my head sweat. Yeah, we've got a bunch of baseballs that I collected at the time. Maybe we'll go over those uh, in a few minutes. But we're here to talk about this team because it was a great team for OU. It was uh, it shaped a lot of my fandom. It was a professional, a, a sports fandom high note uh, personally. And we've got a lot of um, interesting things to talk about this team. So well. One thing, you know, you mentioned it being a sports high note is that I always think back, uh, we're talking this was the nadir of OU athletics, the early 90s. I mean, things were down, Uh OU football, everybody's pretty familiar with the Gary Gibbs era. Um, OU basketball, it was the tail end of the Billy Tubbs era before Kelvin got there, uh, which was winding down. Uh, at that time, no one cared about softball. No one cared about women's basketball. Uh, so l- literally, I remember once looking to my friends, going, we're a baseball school at OU now. But that's what we are. <laughs> yeah, that's that was pretty interesting. Um, so let's go back to 1994. What was happening around then? I was nine and a half, not really socially conscious, um, mm-hmm. didn't vote. And uh, I remember specifically that there was no MLB World Series that year, right? The season, there was a strike. 
I forget exactly when the that strike happened. started. The strike. I remember the strike actually took started taking place in uh, September, if I'm not mistaken, because I was already in school for that '94, either August or September. Um, but it was late because I remember vividly going to an '89ers game. Uh, and them announcing over the loudspeaker that this is the highest level of professional baseball now being played <laughs> because the, the strike took place. And I remember that was the start of the 94 school year for me. So it had to be August or September. But uh, the strike was looming even back in June. Everybody knew there was a good chance something bad could happen. So all baseball fans, scene heads, whatever you want to call us, we saw that looming. Kind of, I, I kind of stuck my head in the sand and hoped it wouldn't happen. But uh, before that even happened, we had this wonderful run in 94. Where yeah. were you at in 94? You said you went to most of the games? Yeah, I was at McKinley Elementary School. Um, McKinley and McKinley okay. were the best around. I'm old. Yeah, and uh, I was hanging out on the left field berm uh -huh. a lot at the time. Um, my father sat over there. I think so that he could smoke his cigar. I think that was still allowed in 1994. Um, and you had this great... That was when the home dugout was on the first yes. base side. They were flip-flopped. Of Eldale Mitchell is. Park, which is was uh, at that time all burned down the mm -hmm. sides of the, of the and, stadium. And no covering. Uh, over no the, covering yeah. above it, just baking in the heat, mm -hmm. making my father sit there. And um, we would sit on the third base side to, like, I don't know, because there were fewer people. He didn't want to be around a bunch of people, and I got to roam around. And so I learned quickly to pay attention to left-handed batters because they were more likely to foul balls mm -hmm. to the left side. So that, that'll that come important in, in just a minute. Um, but let's talk about where you were in 1994 because you had a little bit of a different experience as an adult, a, a young adult. I trying to say, adult, adult. That's, that's pretty strong language for me back then, but... Uh, ninety four, yeah, or now, to tell you the truth. In ninety four, uh, being in college, I I had to get, I I got a part time job in college, and I was working at a feed store, a feed store combo video store combo uh, uh, lunch and meat store combo pizzeria combo hardware store. You fill in the the word. We did it. Which one? It was the McGuire in McGuire Farm Store located in Slaughterville, which is still there to this day. Just south of North. Yes. And so I started there in January and worked all the way through. So because of that, I didn't have as much free time to get out to baseball game. Honestly, in person, I probably only got to like one or two of the games in person. Now, I watched as many as I could, listened to them on the radio while at <laughs> while uh, slicing deli meat or watching pe washing pizza pans. What's and I would listen to the games. But What's the worst thing that ever happened to you while you were... Uh listening to a game slicing deli meat. Well, I I think I was getting interested in watching the game one night, and it was also, because I also remember it was uh, the first day of the uh, NCAA basketball tournament, so it would be March, so we could probably go back and figure out what exact game I was listening to, but I was uh, cutting up uh, onions for uh, for uh, for sandwiches, and I managed to cut off the end of my thumb. Oh, he's too thick. Ah! <laughs> And uh, so I got distracted, as I want to do every now and then, all the time. And uh, yeah, so I uh, ended up rushing to the, passing out, rushing to the emergency room, uh, wake up, what was the score? <laughs> One of the first things I asked. Nice. Well, that sounds uh, much like you. Trace, what's your initial memory of that OU94 team that season? Okay, so I've got the schedule here, um, 1994 home schedule. By the way, there's a... 50% uh, off the regular menu price at O'Connell's. Uh, maximum discount seven dollars. And that's the original O'Connell's location. And it's just says, a moment, just a moment for that. I know where we're going to go after this. It says valid anytime. Oh my gosh! It yes. says valid anytime. So I just want to be clear. So February sixteenth, we hosted Missouri Southern at three p.m. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing that was like a Tuesday. Um, yeah. Kicking off the season, I'm nine and a half. We probably went there right after school. Yeah, um, it was probably an early game. I had some yeah. awesome supportive parents. I really wanted to go. And we had this guy on the mound who I was like, he seemed pretty cool. I think he wore number 43, maybe. Um, his, uh, yeah, and his name was Kenneth or Kenny. And for me, at nine and a half years old, I was like, 
Gajewski. And I called him Kenny Gajewski, like that whole game, because we didn't I didn't know any better. I think I called him Kenny Gajewski for way longer right. than that. Right. So Kenny Gajewski is actually how you say it, because mm-hmm. uh, Silent J. Uh, was won that game, and then later that weekend, I think something went to o- to extra innings or something. I can't remember because there's no box scores online. But he won like three of the first he, four games he of the did. season. I'm, I'm was looking at that. He, he actually did. He won three of the first five games of the season. Yeah. He was 3-0 and when the team was 5-0. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I, that stood out to me. I was like, Gajewski's on pace to win 30 games! You know, and they only <laughs> played, like, what, 60-some <laughs> in this season? Yeah. So, um, I was pretty stoked about Kenny Gajewski, and I remember that a guy named Eric Thomas yes. was leading off, and he was the designated hitter, right? Now, he was a Juco transfer, and... If you're a baseball person in your nine and a half year old mind, I'm like, why are we betting the DH leadoff? He's supposed to be the power well, guy who bats clean. I mean, you think of DH as you think of big plotting Gorman Thomas or those guys from the major leagues that are that couldn't, you know, you could time them with a sundial running from first to second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we we had a couple of those guys, but one of them was actually playing basketball at the time. So a really interesting thing about this 1994 team, we'll transition into talking about the actual players. We've got um, we've got a roster here that you can probably see, um, and I don't want to show that you because I got a trivia question for you later. Uh, we had a lot of really good players, and several who wound up making the major leagues. Yes, um, we had Mark Redman who mm-hmm. was a left-handed pitcher. He was the best pitcher on that 94 team, no doubt. Yep. Now even another. Decent pitcher on the team was Steve Connolly. His ERA was up, but we got to remember this was like aluminum bats. Well, their the thing to remember about Steve Connolly is that he was the Big Eight Freshman of the Year in 1993. <laughs> that if we could just outtake that line to where that like introduce retail. Like the thing to remember about oh. Steve Connolly. <laughs> okay, so you, so Connolly. So then he, he but, fell back. But, but he, he fell, fell back, back and he actually Connelly. lost his. He lost his starting rotation, though. He lost his by stuff. The, by, well, not his stuff. He lost... <laughs> he, he, like, I lost my hair. No, he lost his rotation. Now it's here. I, I've been Did looking at my hair. It, 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 well, I don't even want to talk about your hair. Right, he lost his thing. rotation stuff. Before. Yeah. So, But he got a cup of coffee in the big loops. Yes, absolutely. So that's two pitchers. Then you had... Uh, Russ Ortiz, Russ Ortiz, who pitched a little like more out of the bullpen at the end of the year. Yes, he had uh, he he finished with twenty two games, games. thirty eight innings. Right, you mm-hmm. had you had him, um, and then you had on the batting side you had Damon Miner. Yes, uh, half of the pride of Hammond, Oklahoma. Yes, and he uh, played for years for the Giants. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And then you had uh, somebody else made the bigs, didn't they? Ryan. Oh. Well, of course, his brother, Ryan Miner. Now, yes. for those not baseball fanatics at home, what is Ryan Miner most famous for? He was the man who replaced Cal Ripken that when Cal Ripken sat after his long Iron Man streak. Right. And I believe that was in 98 or 99. Something, or something like that. So Ryan Miner, meanwhile, was the star... Six foot seven, three point shooter. Yes, on the OU men's basketball. Yeah, in, late in ninety five, Big Twelve, Big Eight Player of the Year in basketball. There you go. So he joins the team halfway through, mm-hmm. and actually becomes, I think, the everyday first baseman. Yes, right? uh, Ryan was a great fielder, uh, and I mean, obviously, he ended up playing third base in the major leagues. But uh, uh, OU already had a very slick building third baseman that year in MJ Mariano. MJ Mariano. But, like, so they would have Ryan Miner at first when he came back, and you pretty much had one of the best fielding uh, teams, especially at the corner right. infield spots that you could have. Right. So both the Miner brothers made the pros. Um, Mark Redman, Steve Connolly, mm-hmm. Russ Ortiz. I feel like we may be missing one other person who, who made the, the pros for a couple of hobby. But then you also had the pitching coach. Oh, um, Vern, Rule. Vern Rule, who ended up a long-time pitching coach in the major leagues right. with the Phillies and Astros. Yep. So it was a it was a pretty robust team. I was reading back uh, of when they won the World Series, and Larry Koshel was talking about how he believed in them. You know, in January, he mm-hmm. thought this was a team that could really go places. So let's go. Let's lay out the, the lineups here. We're not going to okay. take too much longer on this whole 
uh, ridiculous exercise, which we hope you're enjoying. Um, so we had, we just named the infield, right? Mm -hmm. we just, well, you didn't talk about the, it, it, really, so you had these slick building corner infielders when Ryan Miner came back at first and third, but really your offense was powered by your, your second baseman and your shortstop. Uh, at second base, you had Rick Gutierrez, who was the Big Eight player of the year in 94. Right. And then at shortstop, you had Rich Hills, who was a great fielder, good hitter, uh, bordering great hitter, just as steady as can be, all around great play. Yeah. I actually have, um, I remember this well, uh, Monday, April 4th, 1994, 3 o'clock start against Texas Christian University. Oh. Uh, Rick Gutierrez in the, I think, 11th inning hit a home run. Yeah, here it is. My father wrote it on the ball. The game-winning home run, number four on the season, 4-4-94, Mitchell Park, Norman, Oklahoma. Rick Gutierrez hit that walk-off home run, and I ran around the track. This is back when you could get behind the thing where they kept the motor cart and whatnot. And I ran back there and got it. I was I was like out of breath. I think I fell down the berm to try to get there and got that ball. And then I got obviously Rick Gutierrez to sign it because I was convinced he was going to be just an MLB star. I'm actually surprised that uh, Rick and I don't I don't know what happened to Rick afterward. I mean, I, he was actually at the uh, Diamond Dinner Luncheon this year. I didn't make it. I would have liked to have heard how his minor league career turned out, but of all the players, he was the one I was most surprised didn't actually make the major leagues. Yeah. Rich Hills, like what's funny about Rich Hills over at shortstop is that when he was drafted into the minor leagues, they actually, here, here was a guy that played every game at shortstop for the defending, for the national champions and another team you want to call it, and they make him a catcher when they get into the minor That's leagues. That's right. That's right. I was trying to look up, I saw who was drafted that year. You know who the top drafted player was? Wait, is this on my? Is this my? Uh, I'm about to say you're still in your. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not gonna. Yeah. Is that Mark Kotze? Mark Kotze? No, the top highest drafted though. Oh, oh, anyway. you player. I thought you okay. meant. In the so let's go. So the catcher was an interesting story himself. Yes. Javier Flores or Javi Flores was yes. an infielder that they turned into a catcher. Yes, I think that um, that they had a catcher, and I'm probably going to mispronounce his name. Chris Briones. 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 And he didn't hit a whole lot. He was a good a good defensive player, but he didn't really hit a whole lot. As we can see, he was batting uh, like 278, um, but with only two extra base or five extra or four extra base hits. So I think they were probably looking for some kind of some more punch back there. And I guess, although Javi Flores that year only hit 236. Well, that's true. So I have no I idea. Have no clue. My nine and a half year old mind couldn't wrap my head I, around who was managing the game. My brain with Javi Flores always goes to the following year. Yeah, he, hit, he, would, like, he hit a ton and ended yeah. up being the big uh, big eight player of the year. Right. Uh, or I guess it would have been big 12 player of the year by then right. before he left. Uh, now, he was a heck of a defensive player, and I'm not trying to. Uh, Chris, we're at Brion Brionis, wherever you are right now, I'm not trying to dog on your skills behind the plate, but maybe Hoffy was a better defensive catcher. Maybe that Chris too. was injured. Maybe he yeah, that's true his too. Mind. I don't know. <laughs> you um, know, it was 94. You know, Kurt Cobain just died. Who knows? Right. That? Friends was friends launched, I'm pretty sure, that year. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of uh, OJ. OJ. OJ Chase. Uh, so it yes. could have been a lot going on. So in the outfield, we had a, a, a fair amount of outfielders. You had Eric Thomas, yes. who what ended, up played, ended up playing the outfield yes. when, when Ryan Miner came over from basketball because the Damon went to DH a lot of the time. Well, they had they had a their in their outfield to start the year was going to be uh, Jerry Whitaker. It was going to be Darvin Trailer, and it was going to be um, um, Chip Glass. Chip, well, Chip Glass really came in. Jerry Whitaker kept getting pummeled by injury. And he ended up missing most of the second half of the season. And Chip Glass took over for him second in center field. So what you had was Eric Thomas getting a lot of playing time out there in the outfield and eventually taking over all the time in the outfield once Jerry was was out for the rest of the season or for most of the season. Right, yeah. Whitaker played 29 games. Glass played 63. Hills, Gutierrez, and Darvin Trailer played 66 games. Now, I think... The year before, if I'm not mistaken, 
Darvin Trailer was actually he was like he was one of my favorite players yep. because he right. was player. he was the right fielder, left handed guy, like five foot nothing. Mm-hmm. No offense, Darvin. And awesome name, by the way, Darvin Trailer. Like uh-huh. anyway. And he would come in and pitch occasionally. And I think it was nineteen ninety three. Because okay. he had a really strong um, throwing on. Throwing on, right. So and the other thing that's really interesting to think about this nineteen ninety four team. Not only did they were not ranked at the beginning of the season, right? And they started kind of hot, but then starting the conference play, they lost uh, like a bunch. They lost several games to Kansas State, who only won three conference games all season. I think all three of them were against OU. I, and if I if I remember correctly, I believe Tim Walton which was one of the starting pitchers on that team. Held a players only meeting after one of those losses to Kansas State. Maybe okay. You know, the infamous players that. only meeting. Like yeah, no co- no Larry Koshell. We should yeah. mention Larry Koshell. Yes, as was the coach. Um, and uh, so where were we? So after not being ranked after this players only meeting, yes, um, they kind of slugged a little bit through conference play, but then really took off the last uh, part of the season. I think ultimately won the last 17 of their last 21 games. In fact, I was looking, we're we're actually filming this today on May 10th, and on May 10th, 1994, they lost to Nebraska. After that, they only lost twice more for the rest of the season. Wow. And this was back before Super Regionals. Yes. Uh, So they only had the the regional in Texas. I remember what I was going to say. The uh, it was also interesting because one of the reasons they were probably not ranked super highly is they lost their best player the year before, oh, Greg Norton, to the draft. Yes. Greg Norton, who and was, and that was off a fair, pretty mediocre team. I think that team only won thirty one games and barely finished above five hundred. Did not make the NCAA tournament in ninety three. Yeah. So you're losing your best player off that team. Uh, now most people felt they would be improved going into ninety four, but obviously, like you said, they were not ranked to start the season. Most people probably looked at them as you know a team that would fight to make the NCAA tournament. So they had a lot of uh, success toward the end of conference yes. play. Got hot during the regionals. Really hit very well. Had a lot of speed. Had a lot of power. What is your What are your final memories? Um, oh, it, very simple. Uh, the over re, the the person who started grabbing all the spotlight as they made their run through the regional and particularly the College World Series, and I'll never forget this. It was Bucky Buckles. But uh, besides having a great name, Bucky Buckles, he was the closer for that team. But he was way more than a closer, as you and I discussed before we got going. He he pitched. Uh, he he made thirty six appearances that year, but pitched seventy seven innings. So he was pitching several innings per alley. And as we got to the College World Series uh, and in the regionals, he was pitching every game, and he was pitching like the last two, three innings of every game. It was all a matter of getting the ball to Bucky Buckles because when he, he was good during the regular season, good to really good in the regular season, but he reached some type of demigod status in the regionals and, 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 and in the College World Series he just simply couldn't be touched. And didn't he throw a knuckle curve? Yes, it was a weird knuckle curve pitch. I that's With one of the like Bucky Buckles. At one of that's one of the things they talked about, and like I vividly remember either somebody on ESPN or maybe it could have been a local TV like interviewing him and having him showing show them how he threw this pitch. But he ended up becoming front and center on a team with all these major leaguers. On the team, he ended up becoming fr- front and center for this team. Now, he was, didn't end up being the College World Series MVP, we can admit, but for me, he was the, I just remember, I'll never forget how he went from who's Bucky Buckles to he was a, na- na- a national name. Yeah, I think he had the, he led the team in ERA with a 2.22 ERA. Redmond had a 2.71, which is really impressive in, in mid-90s college yes. baseball. They had the nuclear hot bats. Right, which they got rid of literally because lawyers, I think, told them that somebody was going to get killed. Yes, they just kept deadening them and deadening them. But back then, yes, I mean, the, the team ERA was 4.08, right. which is, I mean, if if you had a 
0.08 team ERA in college baseball today, you wouldn't be winning in national championship unless right. you just somehow got crazy hot at the end. Um, well, so, and, and likewise, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine players on the team who each had, you know, at least 100 at bats, basically, who hit above 300. Yes. And and it was, so basically, it would, OU would really, that team would just bludgeon you to death with their offense. And they had just enough pitching around Redmond, who ended up having a long major league career and was really good this season. And in 95, he ended up himself turning into a demi god the next season where he was probably the best I I arguably think the best starting pitcher in college baseball the next season. But he was really good this season. So you had Redmond and you had Buckles on the other end. And then really you kind of pieced it together from there. Uh like you said, Gayeski uh ended up only starting three games that season and he ended up with uh with six wins. And, and it, three of them were in the first five Three of them first. Season. But he made a ton of appearances. Kim Walton, uh, uh, Kevin Lovinger, all these guys were not like the super talented or extreme high major league draft, but they were able to piece them together and behind this great offense, especially when you got Ryan Miner back yeah. from basketball. Well, and they, and again, another not just people who went and played in the bigs, yeah. but we talked about, I think I may have mentioned, maybe I didn't, Gajewski, you may see him on TV right now. Yes. He's the softball coach for Oklahoma State University. And then Tim Walton is, this, is the softball coach for the University of Florida. Yes. So you had a lot of leaders, you know, kind of in that realm. People who notably, for other things, have remained on the athletic scene uh, for years. Damon Miner, I believe, is still coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Greg Norton. Yeah, Greg coaching. Norton was coaching uh, uh, last time I heard you, AAA New Orleans Zephyrs. Uh, also coached down at Auburn. He hasn't been out of the major leagues that long, so so let's uh, let's transition real quick to a couple trivia questions. Okay, well you and, stole a couple of mine uh, already, so well, thank you. All right, I'm dazzled by your coat. I'm going to ask you. Yeah, okay. I'm dressed like Cecil Samara. Um, I don't know if anybody knows that reference. Who's watching? But uh, all right, you don't here's, Google it. Here's a question for you, Jeremy. What two current Big 12 teams did OU not play in 1994? Uh, oh, yeah, you don't want me to look at this. What two look at current? Well, two they probably current. didn't play West Virginia. Yes, that's one. Okay, I figured that would be the case. And But the other one, would it be Texas Tech? Wrong. They played Texas Tech. Did they play? Yeah, now I know your wife's a Red Raider. My wife is a graduate of Texas Tech. I worked in the, I uh, met her when I worked at the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. How do, you describe, right. how do you describe Lubbock? I, I myself like Lubbock. I like Lubbock. Wide streets, not a lot of traffic. Uh, <laughs> okay, anyway. All right. Whatever. But so it was. My it wife was, hated it. <laughs> they they, they she didn't. They begged me to take her out of there. Save me, she said. <laughs> Okay, they didn't play West Virginia, they didn't play Baylor. All right, you're Baylor! Over, you're over one. Hit me with a trivia question. Okay, um, well, like I said, you stole two of mine. Okay, so they, uh, how many innings did OU trail in the College World Series that year? Two out of 74? Eight. Eight. One. Oh, nuts. One inning did they trail. Wow. I think it, I believe it was against Arizona State, but don't quote me on that. Okay, I'm sure. I'm one. All right, I'm over one too. Um, and, okay, who was? I know you're gonna get this one. Who was the College World Series MVP? Oh, that was Chip Glass. All right, uh, that was that was Chip Glass. Chip Glass was the guy who replaced Jerry Whitaker and would be the last person on the team you would ever suspect to be the College World Series MVP. How many home runs did he hit in the College World Series? Three. How many home? How many balls did he hit out of the park? The, that I don't know. Two. One of his. Oh, home was runs one of them inside, was the, the, inside the park home run well, to center field? Well, what's in interesting about the uh, he, he only had what five home runs the whole season. That's what I was looking and up I here. There were Chip Glass had he had six home runs that year, so he hit half of them in the College World Series. Yeah. I mean, he only had uh, he only had like twenty x or thirty extra base hits total yeah. for the season. He came on pretty strong. Okay, so you you got one. Hit me with. Okay, well, I got one more because again, I was All going right. to ask you 
uh, you know, uh, what were their ranking was to begin the season, which okay. was zero. And I was going to ask go ahead, ask Nate, tell me the two co- uh, prominent NCAA softball coaches that were on the roster. Okay, that's fine. But how about, so they played Georgia Tech in the national championship game. Can you tell me, there were three major leaguers in that starting lineup. And I'm not talking cup of, cup of coffee major leaguers. I'm talking three guys who played a long time in the major leagues and were significant players with a couple of them being legitimate stars. So two of them played for the Boston Red Sox. Yes, sir. No more Garcia Parra and Jason Barrett. Yes, those are the two easiest ones to get. And, and one. the third one, I should have looked this up. He, 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 he uh, played in several teams, but he was a was very good player. Uh, yes. Hint? Yes, hint. Uh, um, he shares a last name with a famous NFL running back. Jay Payton. Oh, that's right. That That's right. Okay. Yep. Jay Payton, who played... For several teams in his group, it was the Mets, the Orioles, I believe, but was a very good player and played for a decade. I mean, he wasn't a cup of coffee guy. So, I mean, there's three legitimate major leaguers in that lineup. That, well, I lose, you win on the trivia. Um, I've got one more trivia question as a bonus for you. Oh, dear. On the Wikipedia page for the 1994 OU baseball team, who is listed as the, who has some prankster listed as the Bat Boy? It might be a guy that maybe some former OU players don't like he, oh. who was involved in the team. On the Bat Boy? In yeah, the they listed him as the Bat Boy. I, I, you've got me. Sonny Galloway. Oh. <laughs> well, Gall- Sonny did not coach on the 94 team. He was, he, Sonny was one of the. No, he did. He was a, that's right. He was a. He was there, right there. In well, this, he was. Cigar smoke stained roster that I Sonny, had. Sonny was a, uh, was not a paid coach for that. He was one of the three main assistants. Was he still teaching at Whittier? He, he, I believe he was still teaching at Whittier and Norman High, <laughs> uh, teaching young minds like you and Kirk Keeley and a lot of the other Yardbirds. Uh, Sonny actually came and joined the team this year. Uh, and that was his first year as a paid assistant coach. Oh, wow. Um, and well, what goes around comes around. The college baseball structure right now just voted down a proposal to add another assistant coach, if, if a paid assistant coach, if people want. So what's old is new again. Um, it's been 25 years since I was nine and a half, and you were... <laughs> I don't remember when I was nine and a half. Yeah. And it was been uh, 25 years since, yes, I was 20. Yeah. And I couldn't drink. Well, I hope, legally anyway, uh, oh, well, true. I hope that uh, everybody watching has enjoyed this. Um, and if you haven't, I'm sure you'll let us know about it, because that's what the internet's for. Um, we thought we'd try something new because I hadn't seen any fanfare around the 25th anniversary of the team. There's the uh, raising of the, the plaque that they had. And um, if you've got other ideas for uh, ridiculous remembering some OU. Remember those guys. Yeah. We're good at that. I'm good at that. I, that's all I have are my memories. I don't have my hair or my eyesight anymore. On that note, enjoy these highlights from the 1994 College World Series championship game.
Hey, hope you enjoyed the uh, video cast. I want to give a quick shout out to our good friend, Jeff Roughface, uh, who's no longer with us. Um, big OU baseball fan. Roughface, we miss you. Love you, Roughface. Oh, I took a drink. I'm pouring some out for him in yeah. your garage. Well, that's fine. Pour it out. <laughs> I like it.